So we're continuing on with our conversation with Dr. Baumgartner and her amazing book, South to Freedom, which you all should buy. Um, I have uh, another question, which is admittedly a big one, <laughs> um, is why is, is this book, your work, an important contribution to Civil War era scholarship? Yeah, we don't often think about Mexico as having any role in the coming of a civil war in the United States, much less having any contribution to larger debates about freedom, slavery, and citizenship in the Americas. But Mexico had actually passed really radical anti-slavery laws in the 19th century. It abolished slavery in 1837 and 20 years later adopted a constitution that not only guaranteed freedom to all people in Mexico, but also promised freedom to enslaved people from other countries from the moment they set foot on Mexican soil, which is this really radical promise known as the freedom principle. And just to underscore how radical these laws were, we just need to look to the anti-slavery laws that we're more familiar with. So the northern states had also abolished slavery, passed gradual emancipation laws, but they never extended the freedom principle to enslaved people because of the Fugitive Slave Clause of the U.S. Constitution mm. that guaranteed or tried to guarantee the return of freedom seekers to the South. And the same was true in Canada, where, again, slavery had been abolished in 1833, but there was no formal legal principle that granted enslaved people a claim to freedom. And because Canada continued to extradite criminals to the United States, it did sometimes extradite fugitive slaves who had happened to commit crimes on their escape. So neither of these other countries that we tend to associate with escapes, and rightly so, but they hadn't passed as radical of laws as Mexico. And in fact, the only country in North America that had passed such radical laws was the former French colony of Saint-Domingue, which had revolted against France in 1791, founded the Republic of Haiti, and in 1804 abolished slavery in 1816, passed a constitution that enshrined the freedom principle. And historians have done really remarkable work showing the importance of Haiti's anti-slavery promise, both by undermining slavery in the neighboring islands of Cuba and Jamaica, and also just by terrifying slaveholders in the U.S. South. Right. But Haiti was 500 miles by sea from the southernmost tip of Florida, and Mexico, which had passed the same types of laws, directly bordered the U.S. South, and not just any part of the U.S. South, the Deep South, Texas, Louisiana, where slavery was booming during this period. And Mexico's laws and the enslaved people who both helped to get those laws passed to make Mexico take this anti-slavery stance really pose a threat to the extension of slavery in the southern states. And there are so many examples that I could draw from, but my favorite one is from the 1860 census from Brownsville, Texas, which is right on the Rio Grande. And there are only seven enslaved people listed in Brownsville, Texas in 1860. And four of them are listed as fugitives from the state which we can't be sure that those four enslaved people had escaped to Mexico, but given the proximity of Mexico, it is a likely destination for those enslaved people to have gone. And so we can see that there is the, the fact that Mexico offers legal claims to freedom and citizenship in a place that is so close to spaces of mass chattel slavery, hugely, hugely worrisome, terrifying, concerning to slaveholders in the South. But it's not just in Texas and Louisiana that we see the effects of Mexico's anti-slavery and abolition policies. It comes to be incredibly important, even at the very heart of the Union. And that's because of the conquest of Mexican territories over the course of the US war with Mexico. Now, historians have long argued that the US-Mexico war was important to the coming of the Civil War by accelerating sectional controversy. But it really isn't that clear why it was that that territorial acquisition was so controversial. Because after all, the United States has ex had expanded from the Eastern seaboard to the Pacific and not all of those territorial acquisitions had caused such a, an uproar. Right. And I think that the reason why 
the Mexican session, that, that is the territory that was conquered from Mexico, why that territorial acquisition was so controversial was the fact that it was actually the first time in US history that the United States had conquered and tried to incorporate territory where slavery was explicitly abolished. And the fact that it was explicitly abolished made it next to impossible for Congress to agree to extend the dividing line between North and South that it helped to make that previous expansion more palatable. Instead of just continuing the line of 3630 all the way to the Pacific, right. or that they couldn't do that anymore because Mexico had abolished slavery. And to impose the 3630 line would mean to reestablish slavery where it had been previously abolished. And Northern congressmen of both political parties agreed, and even some Southern congressmen uh, agreed with this point, that it was wrong and unconstitutional for Congress to do that. This was, of course, terrifying to Southern slaveholders and polit pro-slavery political interests because the annexation of this territory, if it became free territory, then the balance of power between North and South would tilt irrevocably in favor of the non-slave holding states. Right. And this is the conundrum that is facing pro-slavery politicians and slaveholders in the 1850s. They need to include more, they need to gain more territory for slavery to recover the balance of power that had been put out of whack by the US war with Mexico. So they try to establish a railroad between the Southern states and California, which Kevin Waite in his new book really explores fully in an attempt to try to move that region, at least to connect it to slaveholding interests. They try to annex Cuba, which would have joined the union as a slave state because slavery already existed there. Mm. They very famously overturn um, the Missouri Compromise Line with the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. And I think one of the ways that we can understand everything that's happening in the 1850s, which sometimes seems like when I'm teaching it, like one thing after another, where the <laughs> sectional controversy is just, we're like on the escalator to the Civil War. Um, but one way I think to make sense of all of those events is this is attempts to restore the balance of power that was undermined by the fact that the United States had conquered and annexed this territory where slavery was explicitly abolished. And so I think to sum up, I think this book is important to understanding the Civil War, both because it shows that the escape of enslaved people was troubling, not just the escape to the North, but also to the South, that slaveholders were under threat, not just from one direction, but from all sides, from the North and from the South. And it's also important to understanding the Civil War, I think by making sense of those really rapid political events that are kickstarted by the US war with Mexico and that ultimately culminate with the secession of the Southern states. I mean, you're dropping so many bombs on my head right now. I'm just trying to process all this. This is. This is why I loved reading and was hoping to talk with you. Um, so, I mean, your book to me um, touches on so many different layers, which you brought up and there's even more uh, in the book and hopefully we'll get to in some more conversations. But I saw this as helping me understand, you know, African-American history, political history, legal history, history broadly, but even borderlands history. You know, there's, there's so many, and even the gender, depending on how you want to discuss citizenship through military service that, I walked into the book thinking one thing and I left realizing I didn't know as much as I thought about the complexity of slavery and freedom, right? When you talked about, even as you were speaking now, I wrote down the, the escape and the troubling nature of it and that we, including myself, when, when I teach this from going forward, this period of time, which you're right, to students, it always seems like a foregone conclusion, you know, by the time we get to Harper's Ferry and, and even John Brown, it, it was supposed to be. It's like, well, I mean, not really, but... Now it looks that obvious um, that we need to look at the tri-national dynamic of, of slavery, right? That, and what does it mean if, if we've only privileged the escaping to Canada, as you point out, when they have extradition with the United States and, and the, prince, the freedom principles uh, with Mexico? Like that's the stuff to me that keyed off and it just logistically makes the most sense that they would go south if you're living in Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, rather than making that arduous journey 
through the North. So I think uh, that was a profound thing for me that I, it seems like an obvious, like, duh, but at the same time, to see it the way you spelled it out. And I think one of the biggest strengths of your book is that it's written with such a great prose that it's accessible to a broad audience. Um, it's it's not dense, it, it gets right to the points and, and you weave some amazing stories within it that I think it, it touches on so many different subfields of Civil War era history. Um, so I was just curious what you thought about reconsidering how we talk about, or even teach, as you point out, what does it mean for, for freedom if we're only looking at Canada and not acknowledging the Southern? Yeah. Well, the history of why we come, why we think of Canada first, why we think of the Northern states first is itself a really good teaching mm. tool right. because the mythology and the history of the Underground Railroad really began in the late 19th century with William mm. Siebert, historian who interviewed people who claimed to be conductors on right, that right. northbound underground railroad. And it was adopted as this really important mythology because it helped to say that even though the United States had committed that sin of slavery, that at the same time, there were white people and you know, early understandings right. of the Underground Railroad were predominantly, oh, here are these nice white saviors who are coming to, right. to save these enslaved people, that this was a way to say we weren't all wrong. There was just part part of us that was, that was part of the nation that was right. um, complicit in this. And that even though we have moved thank goodness, away from this white savior model of the yeah. Underground Railroad to works uh, you know, like what Manisha Sinha is doing and others, Richard yes. Blackett showing that this is really Eric Foner, that this is an interracial movement that is, um, that is helping to bring people to the North. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, one of the reasons why it has been so hard for, or it's, it's taken so long for us to understand that there was this southbound railroad or I shouldn't say railroad because it I have problems with the, right, the, right, the railroad right, terminology here right. uh, not to mention that in Mexico you know they would be like they were building underground railroads in the <laughs> in the 19th century it's like no 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 it's figure right. of speech but right. um that we often think about Mexico as this impoverished politically corrupt uh, destabilize, unstable un, 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 un place. And I don't mean to suggest that Mexico is this perfect place that right. we've you know, gotten it all wrong, but that it's hard, it's, it's much easier for us to believe that Canada mm. was offering freedom to people. And I think it's like much harder for people to imagine that Mexico could be a place that was contributing to these right. broader debates about slavery and freedom right. um, and that we should, that we shouldn't let the assumptions that come in large part from the way in which Mexico is depicted in the news from right. help making us discount the role that Mexico is playing in this broader story. I mean, to your point, I mean, the, you know, I think even my, you know, first foray as a kid learning about, you know, Frederick Douglass and, you know, the North Star, right? Like that, 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 to your point about the mythology of freedom and, you know, just as a cheap plug, there is a new book uh, about William Still that's going to be out by the time this is released, which I'm really excited for. So to see how they, uh, you know, that's incorporated into the conversation. But I think this book, your book, was profound, and I mean this in the most sincere way, at I needed to do a better job of acknowledging Mexico's important role in understanding black liberation and freedom during times of slavery and the 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 complexity of what that means once they get there, which we'll get into you know very soon. But I think that that is a profound contribution uh, to the field um, that deserves even more like I want to know more. Um, because for me it was just like I had so many questions um, after reading your book about, you know, connections to United States colored troops. Um, what does it mean for families? Um, you know, the, the black community often, as you point out, um, celebrates the West Indies uh, or um, the Hades uh, liberation and that freedom. Now I'm wondering, were there any um, connections to celebrations for when they realize what Mexico is offering for them as well? Which if you know, someone's not doing that project, I'd love to read it or, you know, so please do it. Uh, but I think that this has left me with so many exciting questions about um, what is was known within the community, what's not, how it's being discussed. So it's making me want to go back and look through some of my primary sources 
to see how they, or are not, discussing Mexico as it relates to Black freedom and liberation and citizenship, which is uh, where we're going to go to next. So thank you.